Bichette's disease is a rare inflammatory condition, a systemic vasculitis, that affects arteries and veins of all sizes. It was named after the Turkish dermatologist who first described it, which helps us to remember that it is most commonly found in the Middle East and the mucocutaneous lesions that are associated with this condition. It has a common triad of painful mouth ulcers, genital ulcers and uveitis. As we mentioned, one of the most commonly affected areas is the Middle East, and often it is described as being seen in the Silk Road countries around the Mediterranean. Overall, it affects both genders equally. However, in the Middle East, it is seen more commonly in males, while in Japan and Korea, it is seen more frequently in females. The typical age bracket of those affected is between 20 and 40 years of age. The exact cause and pathophysiology of Bichette's disease is not clear, but it is primarily characterised by an autoimmune reaction targeting the blood vessels. The inflammation is primarily T-cell mediated. Several components contribute to this autoimmune reaction. Genetically, there seems to be a strong correlation between Bichette's disease and the HLA-B51 alleles of the major histocompatibility complexes. Environmental factors include an association with infection, primarily herpes simplex virus 1 and streptococcus sanguis. Some theories suggest that the way these infections trigger Bichette's disease is a crossover between the heat shock proteins in the microorganism and that in humans. For example, in response to streptococcus sanguis heat shock protein, anti-heat shock protein 60 is produced which is thought to be able to also cross-react with a human heat shock protein and trigger an immune response. Overall, the autoimmune reaction in Bichette's targets blood vessels, in particular endothelial cells, which is why anti-endothelial cell antibodies have been implicated in the pathogenesis as well, and it is the targeting of the blood vessels that generates the signs and symptoms. Lesions of the mucous membranes and skin are the most characteristic findings of Bichette's disease. Recurrent painful oral ulcers are seen in around 98% of cases, with genital ulcers occurring in around 65% of cases. The genital ulcers are mostly seen on the scrotum in males and vulva and vagina in females. Other cutaneous manifestations include erythema nodosum, pseudofolliculitis, or acneform lesions, which appear as papules and pustules resembling acne. Next, we have ocular manifestations, and the typical finding is bilateral uveitis that is often chronic and may be anterior, posterior, or a panuveitis. Vitritis, which is an inflammation of the vitreous humor within the eyes, is also a possible finding, as is retinal detachment. The eyes are involved in up to 70% of cases of Bichette's disease and is significant as around a quarter of these patients become blind. Along with vision disturbance, sensory neural hearing loss has been found in up to 80% of patients. The cardiovascular system is heavily involved and both arteries and veins of all sizes may be affected. However, venous involvement is more common and approximately 30% of patients have venous thrombosis. The mortality in Bichette's disease is around 9%, and cardiovascular disease is responsible for around half of this. Inflammation of the heart layers may also be seen, including pericarditis, myocarditis, or endocarditis. Arterial aneurysms are another feature. The rupture of these can cause hemorrhage, and that can contribute to the mortality. It is also possible to have thrombosis of the coronary arteries, leading to a myocardial infarction. Neurological involvement is seen in around 40% of cases, and this contributes significantly to the morbidity. Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis may be seen, and like we mentioned in the cardiovascular system, it is also possible to see aneurysms of the central nervous system arteries that may also rupture. When the brain parenchyma is involved, this is considered neurobichette's disease, which is typically an acute onset of signs and symptoms such as a headache, meningitis, or neurological deficits 
including cranial nerve palsies. Personality changes are also possible. In around 45% of cases, there can be arthralgia or arthritis, and this mostly affects the knees and the ankles. Bichette's disease can also affect the gastrointestinal system, causing abdominal pain and diarrhea, which may include blood, which, when combined with the ocular and joint involvement, can make it difficult to distinguish from inflammatory bowel disease. To add to this, Bichette's most commonly affects the ileocecal region and also can affect the ascending and transverse colon in particular. The diagnosis is based on the international study group criteria, which includes recurrent oral ulcers, as well as two or more of recurrent genital ulcers, ocular lesions such as uveitis, other cutaneous manifestations such as erythema nodosum, pseudofolliculitis, or acniform lesions, or another criteria is a positive pathogen test. Overall, there is no cure for Bichette's disease. It is characterized by a relapsing and remitting course, with the aim of treatment being symptom management. The condition often carries significant morbidity due to the loss of vision and neurological involvement, but also carries a 9% mortality that is mostly related to the thrombosis and aneurysms in the cardiovascular system. Treatment can include corticosteroids, either topically or systemically, which is usually given as oral prednisolone or intravenous methylprednisolone. These steroids are usually continued for four weeks. However, it is common for symptoms to return after the steroid course has finished. Therefore, immunosuppressive agents like azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and cyclosporin A are often used in conjunction with steroids. Also, colchicine has been shown to be effective against the mucocutaneous lesions. Tumor necrosis factor blockers have been shown to be effective in Bichette's, such as infliximab, etanercept, and adalimumab. It is important to look for latent tuberculosis before starting these medications, as the anti-tumor necrosis factor activity can lead to reactivation of latent tuberculosis.